You might say that those are qualities that you should look for in a minister. However, if that minister's behaviour is such that civil servants are simply too afraid to work with them, and we've had reports of civil servants bursting into tears before and after meetings with Rob allegations uh, of, of being sort of shouted at and belittled, uh, and some reports of civil servants actually being physically sick because of the fear uh, around dealings with that minister. Yes, that, that is something to consider. In terms of where the Conservative Party kind of is at the moment, it's a headache for Rishi Sunak because his entire message as, as Prime Minister was that he was going to bring back integrity and transparency. It's very difficult to maintain that if he gets a lengthy report making some quite serious allegations against his Deputy Prime Minister and then doesn't act. However, Dominic Raab was one of his key supporters. It doesn't look great for him either to, to lose his right-hand man like that. Mm. Uh, as, as you say, it does really bring into question lots of questions about Rishi Sunak's judgment because, you know, whether or not he knew about these allegations when he took Dominic Raab on. That's definitely going to be the next question. These are not new allegations, not new reports. Uh, Dominic Raab, obviously, a lot of this stuff happened, uh, it's alleged to have happened when he was serving in Boris Johnson's government. Rishi Sunak has pretty much as soon as he became Prime Minister, reappointed him as Justice Secretary and indeed as Deputy Prime Minister. So giving him a role that really shows he has confidence in, in Dominic Raab. So there will be questions about what he knew when, what he was informed of when. Uh, and, you know, you, you have to remember that he lost Nadine Zahawi uh, in, in circumstances that were in some ways embarrassing that he wasn't aware of, of the disputes or he said he wasn't aware when he appointed him. So again, losing another minister like this, it doesn't look good. However, keeping him on, if the report is particularly damning, that uh, brings something that brings its own challenges too. Rachel, is it too early to talk about possible successes if he does have to go? <laughs> there are some names in the mix, uh, Victoria Atkin, uh, Lucy Fraser, uh, Victoria Prentice, who's our current Attorney General. You'll notice those are all women. I think there is an understanding that gender balance is something that this particular cabinet isn't great at. So those are the names that are currently being floated. I imagine that when it comes to, to filling this role, which you see now, we want to make an appointment very quickly. He's had a number of months to consider who might fill that role. And one would hope that he's done a bit of vetting on all of those candidates so he doesn't end up in the same position again. Hmm. I mean, it is obviously enormously exciting for, for Westminster watchers and political journalists, but do you think the story has cut through with the public especially? Uh, I think that there's so many different news stories going on at the moment, and certainly the Conservatives have been benefiting in, in recent weeks, as indeed the Labour Party has as well, by the chaos going on north of the border in Scotland with the SNP. And I think both the main Westminster parties have benefited from looking rather competent in comparison to that having a major ministerial sacking or resignation, if that is indeed what happens, does bring the focus back to Westminster, back to the Tory party, back to some of the chaos of the Boris Johnson, Liz Truss era. Uh, so it will have an impact, even if most of the public don't particularly know or, or, or care about Dominic Raab all that much. Good point. Uh, Rachel Candler from the New Statesman, very good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Well, our political correspondent, Amanda Acas, is, is in with me here in the studio. And, and Amanda, just picking up from what Rachel was saying there uh, in terms of what the public reaction to this is, of course, we've got local elections on the horizon as well. So the Prime Minister will, will really want to get this cleared up very quickly, won't he? Yes, I think all of this mess um, really harks ba back to that kind of the sense of chaos that we had under Boris Johnson's government. And I think Rishi Sunak throughout has been keen to kind of argue that he's a clean broom, that he's going to have a government of a professionalism and accountability. Um, Boris Johnson, of course, famously didn't sack Priti Patel when uh, allegations of bullying were upheld against her um, when they were investigated previously. Um, and as we've been discussing, he did move quickly against Nadim Zahawi and indeed Gavin Williamson was forced to resign quite quickly. Um, so I think up to now, he has been trying to show that he, he can take quite decisive action um, in cases um, like this. Um, 
But equally, Dominic Raab is a powerful figure in the party. He's a key ally of Rishi Sunak. He backed him uh, throughout his leadership campaign. Um, he was his deputy prime minister as well as justice secretary. So if he does decide to sack him, um, that's that's potentially two posts he has to fill. We were hearing some of the names there that could be appointed in his stead, but no prime minister really wants to have a kind of um, cabinet reshuffle just before a local election. It can cause um, all kinds of... Uh, of, of, of mess, really. And, and Dominic Raab, also someone uh, who is quite popular in the right of the party. So when he was previously Justice Secretary under Boris Johnson, he was the one that was leading the way and attempting to uh, get the UK out of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, something which is very popular with the right of the party and something, indeed, we've been talking about as the kind of the foundation of this rebellion over the small boat, boats legislation. So I think, of course, we have to wait and see what is in that report. And I'm sure everyone in Westminster will be scrutinising it very carefully. I I think unless he's completely exonerated, it's going to be quite a difficult call for the Prime Minister. And of course, we know it's going to be an extensive report. These eight different allegations relating to his roles at three different government departments over a period of years. Some 24 different people, it's thought, at least um, involved in this, but we wait to see what's in it. Amanda, thank you. Uh, we're going to break into this story to bring you another breaking news. Let's take you to Ukraine. Secretary General of NATO Jens Stoltenberg is visiting there on a surprise visit. He's speaking to the camera. Let's listen in from homes and hospitals, playgrounds and um, power stations. This morning I visited the butcher and I was deeply moved by what I saw there. Russian atrocities continues against the Ukrainian people today. And those responsible must be held to account. I also laid a wreath at the wall of remembrance of the fallen for Ukraine. I pay tribute to all those who have lost their lives or suffered wounds, seen or unseen, in defense of their homeland. They will not be forgotten. Mr. President, I'm here today with a simple message. NATO stands with Ukraine. We stood by you after Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014. We stand by you today in your heroic uh, fight against uh, the Russian invaders and in defense of your country. And we will stand by you tomorrow as you rebuild and work toward a brighter future for the Ukrainian people. Over the years, NATO allies have provided training for tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers. And since last February, NATO allies have delivered more than 150 billion euros of support, including 65 billion euros of military aid. This has enabled your troops to force Russia out of Kiev, Kherson and Kharkiv. Allies are now delivering more jets, tanks and armoured vehicles. And NATO's Ukraine fund is providing urgent support, including medical supplies, mobile satellite systems and platoon bridges. All of this is making a real difference on the battlefield every day. We do not know when this war will end, but we know that Russian aggression is a toxic pattern that must be stopped. We agreed on the importance of a just and sustainable peace. And I strongly welcome President Zelensky's peace plan. We must continue to strengthen Ukraine's armed forces, and we must ensure that robust, powerful arrangements are in place for Ukraine's security. Let me be clear. Ukraine's rightful place is in the Euro-Atlantic family. Ukraine's rightful place is in NATO. And over time, our support will help you make this possible. Today, 
The President and I discussed a multi-year support initiative. This will help you transition from Soviet-era equipment and doctrines to NATO standards and ensure full interoperability with the Alliance. It is a testament to NATO's long-term commitment to Ukraine. NATO stands with you today, tomorrow, and for as long as it takes. So, President Zelensky, thank you again for hosting me here today. I look forward to welcome you to the NATO summit in Vilnius in July. Well, Jan Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, speaking uh, in an unexpected visit to Kiev, talking about NATO standing with Ukraine, how NATO stood with them in 2018 when Crimea was annexed by Russia. He, he, NATO stood by them today and that they will stand by them tomorrow as they build a brighter future for the Ukrainian people. And just at the end there, uh, talking about how NATO wants to help Ukraine transition its military from the Soviet era uh, to the NATO era and NATO stands with them today. Uh, let's bring in retired Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell, who joins me now from the newsroom. Uh, Sean, how significant is it, uh, this visit in itself, but also what he just announced there about this military transition from the Soviet era? Jane, I think it was, it was fascinating from a military perspective. I mean, let's be clear, Ukraine is not in NATO. It will take quite some time for Ukraine to ever meet the requirements to join NATO. But uh, Hans Stoltenberg was very, very clear that um, NATO is there to support and stands firm with Ukraine. He also talked a fair bit about condemning the Russian invasion, but also preparing for the future. And it doesn't appear at the moment that NATO is prepared to put boots on the ground in Ukraine. Ultimately, NATO is a defensive alliance. And, but a lot of the West is providing military support. But I think the language here was that uh, although Russia will be paranoid about NATO expansion and also about potential for Ukraine to join NATO, Helen Stoltenberg could not have been clearer that by paving the way in the future, Ukraine will have to be rebuilt. Currently, its uh, core infrastructure in the military is former Soviet Union, uh, former Russian kit, but a lower tier. And almost certainly what they're trying to do now is to offer the potential for um, Ukraine's equipment to gradually be brought up to Western standards, bring up the sort of technology and provide Ukraine with its own credible military capability as a transition to joining NATO. And that language up till now, there's always been some concern about would uh, Ukraine ever be able to join NATO or would it have to be remain in that buffer zone to placate President Putin and his Russia? This was the first time we've held this overt um, uh, statement from NATO Secretary General that says we are planning for you to join, we're going to make it easier for you to join and actually there's some sunny app plans beyond this. So it, it was a really important statement for, for the NATO Secretary General and really important visit for him actually into Ukraine itself. And, and in terms of, of, of that first uh, overt statement and the fact that, that we haven't really had one before because of the concern over Russian reaction, what do you think Russian reaction will be to this? Do you think President Putin is sort of throwing something at the telly right now? <laughs> he will undoubtedly be frustrated, but let's be clear, from a grand strategic perspective, the war is not going well for President Putin. He's losing a hell of a lot of soldiers, grindingly slow progress in the Donbass, and he will be paranoid about the impact of the forthcoming spring offensive from Ukraine. And uh, if you look at most of the metrics, he wanted to stop uh, NATO expansion. You know, no, um, Finland's joined, Sweden's on its way, and all of a sudden now you're talking about Ukraine potentially joining. That's a crushing blow to his ambition. It's also evident that Russia's is, is economy is suffering, so this will be very unwelcome. But what we have to be careful of here, and I'm sure NATO will be aware, they've got to finesse a line here because they do not want to play to the Russian narrative that they are fighting NATO, because actually what they're doing is fighting Ukraine, and Ukraine is simply using Western support of uh, equipment to fight that war. They've got to be really careful to finesse this, to not play to Putin's narrative to potentially expand this conflict if it is actually appears to be NATO uh, fighting, uh, fighting Russia. Okay.
Sean Bell, uh, very good to talk to you on that. Thanks very much. I'll just remind you uh, of that breaking story uh, in the last few minutes. The NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg has been talking in Kiev, talking about welcoming Ukraine into NATO, giving uh, his first overt statement that NATO would be welcoming Ukraine and that NATO would like to help Ukraine transition from their Soviet-era defence systems into those compatible with NATO. He says he would like to see uh, Ukraine in its rightful place in the Euro-Atlantic family and in NATO, and he said that NATO stands with Ukraine now, uh, in the past, today, and will stand with NATO in the f with Ukraine in the future as they rebuild their country. Uh, the other breaking news story, of course, that we will also update you on uh, is Dominic Raab. The report into his behaviour uh, has reached now the Prime Minister's desk. The Prime Minister is now deciding what to do with that report. If there's any updates on that, we'll bring them to you uh, as soon as we can. But let's stay with what is happening in Ukraine. And the US ambassador at large for global criminal justice has told Sky News that the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, needs to be held accountable for the Ukrainian children who've been taken from their homeland. Beth Van Skok told me that Russia is systematically moving children out of Ukraine. The latest figures suggest more than 6,000 have gone missing, but she expects the number to be far higher. I started by asking her how she'd define What's happened to these children? This is, in essence, a grave breach of the 1949 Geneva Conventions, which protect members of the civilian population from being forcibly deported or forcibly transferred from territory during an armed conflict situation. So these children have been abducted, essentially kidnapped. They've often been taken across an international border and then have been sent to very far-flung places within Russia and subjected to what are, in essence, sham uh, adoptions, potentially. And so this is indeed the basis for the two arrest warrants that were recently issued by the International Criminal Court against President Vladimir Putin himself and Russia's children's um, commissioner, Maria Lobova-Bolova. Russia is saying that it's acted on humanitarian grounds, that it's protecting the interests of children in the area where military action was taking place, and it hasn't moved anyone against their will. Why do you not believe them? Well, for one, Russia is not able to claim that they are doing this for humanitarian grounds when they have, in fact, created the humanitarian crisis that put these children at risk in the first place. These children were in civilian areas that came under Russian attack. So they, Russia cannot turn around and say they're doing this for humanitarian purposes. The reality is these children have been taken. They have had their phones confiscated, is our understanding. They're not able to contact their loved ones, guardians, others who want them back and want to know where they are. They have not just been taken to safe places within Ukraine, but rather taken across an international border and often taken to areas very far from Ukraine. The point of any sort of a humanitarian evacuation that might be allowed under the laws of war is that it is temporary, temporary and that it is immediately reversed when the conditions um, subside that cause the need to take that. And none of this has happened. How many children and families could be affected here? more than 6,000 children who have parents, guardians, loved ones, others who want them back, have been forcibly taken from Ukraine and are now um, gone, essentially, and are not necessarily in touch with their loved ones. So that, I have a feeling, is a, a, a figure that is too low. And I imagine that as more open source information emerges, we will be able to add to that figure and to show the, the full scope of what Russia has done here with respect to Ukraine's children. 6,000 is an astonishing figure, even if you